What if I told you the speed at which food travels from your mouth to, well, the other side could not only be telling you something about your metabolic health and risk for obesity, but also what the tens of trillions of microorganisms calling your body home are up to. All I gotta say is, it's a hell of a lot of value from a stalk of corn and a stopwatch, if you ask me. Yo, 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 what is up? Welcome back to another week of How to Health. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and longevity and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic way. Today, we are taking a look at some new, hot off the scientific press data, highlighting how our gut microbes, and more specifically, the communities which are most prevalent within us, may be modulating our risk of obesity in a new and interesting way adding yet another bullet to their long and growing resume, highlighting the reach of their tentacles of wisdom throughout our body. And making me personally continue to question, who's really running the show here? But that's a question for another day. And one that could never really be verified because if they were controlling us, they would essentially be making this video right now, which would be both the ultimate cover up and potential plot for the next big Netflix hit. You guys heard it. Don't forget my cut when it gets made, but we digress. Because we are focusing today's cranial resources on exploring the connection between certain micro patterns in the gut and obesity. As mentioned, diving into some new human research, highlighting how these patterns potentially lead to different obesity outcomes based on their ability to harvest energy. And as always, finishing up with some tips and strategies to help reshape your microbe communities to ones that march to the tune of health and longevity. So whether it's us or our microbes behind the cranial steering wheels, put that five pound mushy membrane in neutral, sit back and enjoy the journey into the smelliest place on earth, the human digestive system. Okay, fine, there are probably smellier places, but you know, it's all about good transitions. Our microbes and obesity. More than a decade ago, studies on rodents discovered that the gut microbiota may very well influence their host's energy balance, proposing that an obese-associated gut microbiota had the power to influence its host physiology through increased capacity to harvest energy from the diet. And guess what? Since then, several studies have confirmed this theory, displaying that when an obese associated gut microbiota was transplanted into germ-free mice, meaning mice bred without a microbiota, those mice indeed gained more body weight and fat mass compared to mice transplanted with a lean associated gut microbiota. And modern research has taken this micro manipulation even further, displaying the same outcome when obese human microbiota were transplanted into germ-free mice. And interestingly, one of the findings from these poop swapping studies was that the weight gain was negatively correlated with fecal gross energy, implying that differences from the microbiome's ability to extract energy from the diet could be one of the drivers of the obesogenic outcome. And from studies like these, and many more highlighting our microbiome's vast influence throughout our body. Three enterotypes, or classifications based on the bacteriological composition of the gut microbiota, were created, all in an effort to try and group some common bacterial patterns among us intelligent walking apes, and to try and make some sort of sense of the tens of trillions of microbes in there. And each of these groups have been characterized by the species of bacteria which rule in abundance. Now's the part of the video where I purposely botch some pronunciations. See what I did there? We have type B, represented by a abundance of Bacteroides species. Then we have type R, represented by the species Ruminococcaceae. And finally, we have type P, represented by the species Prevotella. Now, it's important to note that these compositions are broad characterizations of thousands of different subspecies types which comprise them, all being influenced by many different factors from our journey out of the womb to the mass migration which takes place in the first 36 months of life, all of which we cover in depth in this importance of microdiversity powwow here. But even though these early microbe settlers have potential to stick around for decades, this ecosystem within is anything but set in stone. 
along the way of this thing called life. It is continuously modulated by the food we eat, environment we interact with, exercise and sleep we get, medications we take and everyday items that we use. Basically just a bulleted list to say the lifestyle that we live. Now here's where things get interesting. These three microbe classification types or patterns have been suggested to differ in metabolic capacity when it comes to the degradation of carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. For example, preliminary data suggests that type B seem to be better equipped to extract energy from the carbohydrate-rich Western diet. While the P type are more associated with complex dietary fibers and R type more equipped for metabolizing proteins. All that being said, this is still very much a black box when trying to understand the disparities between all these different classifications of microbes and how they harvest energy. And it's unknown whether intestinal transit time, which is linked to gut microbial composition, diversity, and metabolism, is a factor in this energy harvest. Which brings us to this new study. Time for the corn and the stopwatch. No, no. Okay, kinda, you'll see. The study. Researchers out of the University of Copenhagen sought to see how composition or pattern type of microbes in humans affects their ability to harvest energy from the food they eat, and ultimately if there was any association with obesity. To do this, they examined the energy content in stool specimens of 85 overweight Danish men and women for a period of seven days. During this time, they mapped the composition of gut microbes for each participant and monitored the intestinal travel time for each meal. Sounds fun, right? Not stopping there, they also looked into different metabolite and diversity signatures across the study group to see what correlations and associations showed significance. Heading into this study, they hypothesized that those with long digestive travel times would be the ones that harvested the most energy from their food. And all I gotta say is, they were in for a little bit of a surprise. So, what'd they find? Well some interesting and somewhat polarizing poop. I, I, I mean stuff. First, being that their sense of smell still worked. Okay, maybe, maybe that was a secondary outcome. First, they found that about 40% of the participants fell into the B-type classification of microbiomes. This group was classified by having a lower diversity of gut bacteria and faster travel time for their food through the digestive tract. Also finding, interestingly enough, that this B-type signature, on average, extracted more energy from their food when compared to the other classification types. And get this, these B-type participants tended to weigh about 10% more on average. Damn, okay. But what about the other groups? Continuing on, another 40% of the participants classified as R-type, while the last 20% classified as P-type. Here, researchers found the highest diversity and levels of microbiota-derived proteolytic metabolite, or protein-specific metabolites in the stool and urine of R-type individuals. Also finding that these R-type individuals had the longest digestion transit time, suggesting that there was a more complex microbial ecosystem in these individuals. Another fun observation here was the overall negative correlation between digestive transit time and fecal short-chain fatty acids, which are key health-promoting metabolites secreted by the microbiome. This suggests that there may be more potential absorption of these short-chain fatty acids among the longer transit time groups. But overall, these findings threw the researchers' hypotheses upside down, because counterintuitively, the shorter digestion times were associated with more energy harvesting, as shown throughout the observations in both the B-type and R-type microbiomes. They speculate, because that's simply all they could do, that this was due to the increased complexity of a more diverse microbiome brought to the digestion party, although much more investigation is warranted. Calling out that this research was neither intended nor sufficient to establish any causal relationship between different dietary habits, microbe communities, and obesity. But it certainly sets the stage for further research down the line to build on. 
pretty cool and informative, if you ask me. Oh, you, you didn't ask me? Your microbes did. Well, my microbes are currently telling me that there seems to be a very interesting theme that keeps sticking out here. It seems that this data reinforces that microbe diversity is probably good for biological business. And although we all currently have our settled community of microbes, there are a number of different levers that we can toggle to improve our diversity and thus our cellular and metabolic situation. Let the microdiversity geek out commence. Getting more diverse. All right, I got some good news and I got some bad news. The good news is, as mentioned before, our microbiome tends to be heavily influenced by our lifestyle and environment. Now, the bad news is that our microbiome tends to be heavily influenced by our lifestyle and environment. Because for the greater intelligent walking ape population on this beautiful floating rock, those two things need a lot of nurturing. Nurturing that is not being done which shows itself with the ever-rising prevalence of modern-day metabolic disease. But, ending on some good news, that means you, yes you, happen to be in more control than you believe. Because you do, of course, own the decision-making when it comes to that, at least if your microbes let you. And when it comes to diversity, although more doesn't necessarily mean better, data suggests that it's more often than not better for pretty cool meat suit health and happens to be an area the average person in the modern world can make some improvements in. The tricky part always being the fact that the ideal microbiome is most likely different for each and every one of us. And factors such as age, environment, lifestyle, diet, sleep, and medications place us all in a different starting spot. So keep that in mind when you begin to improve your relationship with these intestinal massaging creepy crawlers. Vivid image, I know. With that, here are some ways to explore getting a little more diverse. First, get outside, and maybe even a little dirty. Now, this may just be a tad different than what society has trained you to do, but that may be even more of a reason to hear me out. We've evolved for millions of years out in the elements, in the environment with nature. However, in this modern society, we spend an estimated 80 to 90% of our lives indoors. While the majority of health modulating microbes happen to be out there. Combining this with our over cleanly, disinfecting ways, there's a possibility that these modern day habits could be doing more harm then good. Because with every spray, sanitation, and gargle, we are not only wiping out potentially harmful microorganisms in, on, and around us, but we're wiping out the protective ones too, and opening up the opportunity for nefarious pathogens to become settlers. So getting a little dirty in nature is a prescription that we simply do not fill enough. It builds and nurtures a biodiverse holobiome or community of microorganism settlers that protect and aid our health inside and out, while also tuning and making the immune system more efficient. So why are you still inside? Come on, get out there. By the way, having a pet is also a surprisingly good strategy, especially when they go outside, roll around and proceed to nap in your bed, bringing in all those good microbes, just their way of saying they love you. If you wanna geek out more here, we'll have a full breakdown of the underappreciated skin microbiome linked in the description below. Next step on your microdiversity journey, you wanna keep a close eye on all the cleaning supplies, body care items, and broad spectrum antibiotics that you use and take. These have been shown to impact both the gut and body microbiome in suboptimal ways. My rule of thumb is if I wouldn't eat it, I ain't putting it on my body. Now, antibiotics are clearly a case by case decision. So have an active conversation with your doctor and understand the risks, benefits, and impact to your microbiome. I'll link a video where we discuss some of these questions in the show notes below. Moving on, we cannot forget the impact of good old food because what you eat, they eat. Here are some things I like to consider when feeding my garden within. First, aim to consume a cultured array of foods. 
prioritizing real whole nourishing ones, and switching it up because variety helps with diversity. Adding fermented foods such as natto, miso, kimchi, sauerkraut, yogurt, and any other type of fermented veggies are all good diversity promoting choices. And prebiotics or foods high in dietary fiber are important too. These are the foods that beneficial gut microbes love to ferment on and secrete those beneficial metabolites as a thank you. I mean, they ain't called fiber munchers for nothing. If you're interested, I'll link our full breakdown between prebiotics and probiotics in the show notes below. We also discuss a few options to baseline your gut with home tests in that video. Because as with any health goal where we want to implement meaningful change, we gotta know where we're starting from. Now, on the flip side, data has associated a diet abundant in ultra-processed foods, aka the modern Western diet, to be lower in microbial diversity while higher in obesity and risk of chronic disease, which by association means longevity risk. As we saw today, one of the reasons for this may be due to its increase in B-type microbe communities. Everything you eat, they eat. Lastly, we can't forget overall healthy lifestyle factors, which we basically talk about in each and every one of our videos as playing a big role too. Sleep, exercise and stress management have all been shown to not only influence our microbes, but also the decisions we make that modulate our microbes. So there's simply no better time to show some love to your external world within. They wield the power to influence your cellular and metabolic operations and thus your health over time. And the facts are we cannot be at our biological best and thus our physical, psychological and emotional best without them. They're here to stay and influence our day in basically every way. So help them help you. Who knows what secret YouTube writing script talents they may have. Seriously though, you guys doing this right now or